Hello, everyone. As you said, I'm Josh Reed, and I'll be talking about uh, the role of open source in the CI CD ecosystem today. Um, I, I work as a release engineer at Ivan. Uh, we're a platform, as a data platform as a service company, and that's given us some unique uh, challenges with regard to testing and delivering our software efficiently. Uh, and uh, it's kind of motivated us to kind of dive deep into the whole ecosystem and landscape of CI solutions. And we found some interesting things. So I'll start today with a poll. Um, who uses CI CD at work? Raise your hand, please. OK. If you, you, oh, you can keep them up, if actually, just a second. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if, you, if it's a software as a service um, offering, like GitHub Actions or something, lower your hand. If you, if you run it yourself, basically keep it up. OK. If it's Jenkins, put your hand down. OK, so we have some people that run something that isn't Jenkins. What, 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 do you mind asking, what, what do you guys run? GitLab, OK, OK. So we have a few other things. OK, so we have a, there's a little bit more diversity here than, than we might normally have. OK, what about open source? If you run CI, CD in your open source projects, OK. If you, does anyone run, do, it's not GitHub Actions. Anyone run not GitHub Actions for their open source? Something that isn't, what do you, what do you run? For, for open source. Yeah. Oh, wow, OK. I didn't. Is Travis CI? Tra they, is Travis CI still going? OK, I used to, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, wow, I mean, so there's, again, like, there's kind of, I hope the point was pretty clear that it's, that it's kind of, there's a few options that we all know. There's not a whole lot of diversity there in what's actually going on. And not many of them are open source. And I want to know how we got here. Was it kind of general problems with open source funding? There's probably a whole series of talks there that I'm not going to give right now, but you know, obviously a part of it. Um, is it switching costs between different systems? I think this can play a big role, because build and CI stuff, that can have a nasty tendency to become this weird glue code that you don't, you know, no one really wants to touch because it works and, you know, leave it alone. Uh, could it be, you know, VC money, zero interest rates policies? causing lots of money to go into B2B uh, IT solutions and taking all that energy away from open source? Maybe. But I think one of the big problems we have here is that one of the big observations we have about this ecosystem is that you, there's free for open source services. And that just makes it easy for people who have a lot going on and a lot to do and not a lot of resources to do them with. Because that, I, I think open source can't compete with business for CI, CD server solutions. Just because, especially with the open source community itself, because most of those projects don't have the ability to run their own systems. There's a few that do. There's a few that might have the resources and time and the reasons to do that. But generally speaking, we're not going to compete in that area. Um, and well, with all the money that's going in, we're not going to compete with it for business either. But perhaps we can find a way to build better tools and components and protocols because we're closer to the problems than businesses tend to be. Because we're not necessarily, you know, we have different incentive structures that uh, influence our design differently. Um, so to give you uh, kind of an overview, I'm going to look, take a look at the CI, CD landscape as it exists today. There's a lot of commercial options out there. Um, GitHub Actions you know, uh, is probably the de facto for a lot of people these days. There's uh, BuildKite. Uh, someone mentioned using that. Does that run? Is there an open source version of BuildKite? Or no? Oh, OK, OK. Um, or maybe they just offer it for free for open source, and I didn't, wasn't aware of it. Um, Circle CI is another popular one, Semaphore. There's actually more. I don't have to put, up, put them all up here now. But the, the thing about these is these are, these are paid for services, generally speaking. Um, there's a couple open core offerings uh, out there. GitLab is the really big one in the field, uh, and Drone. And what I mean by open core is that they have a community edition and an enterprise edition. And usually the community edition has most of what you need to run um, a, a CI CD system, especially for open source projects. But if you want, it doesn't have everything you need to actually run it as a service for somebody else. It's kind of a crucial distinction and the kind of allow, it's what sort of allows them to make money off the hosting of it. Um, then there's some fully open source projects out there. Uh, does anyone recognize any of these? If you recognize one, so we have one person, two people that recognize, okay, a few people. Um, Go CD is a, uh, came from, ThoughtWorks, Martin Fowler's consultancy, if you're familiar with him, uh, it's basically a dead project. There's Tecton, which is part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation, uh, again, part of the, under the Linux Foundation umbrella. That is 
a, something that builds itself is not really a CI CD system, but a toolkit for building one. Uh, it only works on Kubernetes. It's incredibly complicated, and I'm not really sure why it exists. Um, other, I, mean, I, I, I don't know. Task Cluster is what they use to build Firefox that they open source. Uh, it blows away Tecton's complexity um, by a million. And uh, to get it running on your laptop, it's a Docker Compose file that starts 12 containers. I mean, it's a bit complicated if you're going to ask someone to just run this by themselves. And then there's Concourse, which is super interesting, um, really, really fascinating uh, abstraction and model it has around resources changing over time. It's really elegant, uh, but they, they kind of missed that branches are a thing that people like to use in CI, CD, and uh, at least these days. Uh, and it pre I think it predates the, the kind of universal acceptance of the, the near universal acceptance of the pull request as the way we work. Um, and so it, it doesn't really work that well um, for how modern development workflows. So well, we're left with kind of the last big elephant in the room, which is Jenkins, um, which is polarizing, I think, to say the least. Uh, it, for some people, it's the de facto CI CD option. For others, it's something you should avoid at all possible costs. Um, I'm firmly in the latter camp because I've had to work with it for five years. And um, I think it's a hopelessly outdated system that can't compete with any commercial projects. And why it's, uh, I don't understand why it's actually maintained uh, a share, other than that perhaps the, the company that runs Jenkins actually runs it as an open core system, and there's a Jenkins for Enterprise thing that CloudBees sells uh, and is, makes up most of their revenue, I think, to, the, to their disappointment because they wanted to be Heroku at one point in time. Um, and in that sense, it's not really an open source project, not, not fully open source as we might think. We just don't really associate with them the same way we might think of GitLab because CloudBees and Jenkins are not the same name. But, um, you know, Ultimately, all the things you might want to make it more workable, like HA, um, bug fixes, you know, they're available in the Enterprise Edition. They're not available in the community version. Oh, that's the landscape. How is this stuff funded? Um, there's a great talk out there by uh, Evan Chaplicki, who's the um, in creator of the Elm programming language. Um, really worth talk checking out. It's called The Economics of Programming Languages, where he dives really deep into how specifically programming languages get, get made. Um, but a lot of that stuff can apply to any open source or any kind of programming focused projects in general. Uh, but the funding models that I think are most interesting that come out of that are you know, there's corporate funding models, hosting and licenses, patronage, uh, consulting, and foundation models. These are the ones I'll talk about. Um, corporate funding models are where you kind of have multiple ways to derive value. I don't just mean like you're trying to make money, but I mean you're a large company, and because you have many interests, you have multiple ways to get things out of it. There's more advanced, non-obvious revenue streams that you can tap into that uh, perhaps an independent software vendor wouldn't really get access to. Uh, and they can fit into larger strategies because of that. If you think about GitHub Actions, or you think about GitHub in general, that's now part of Microsoft, which is, owns a lot of different things. Uh, and while they offer GitHub Actions as a free thing to open source projects, there's clearly a play in there of getting developers used to that so they'll use it at work. So they will then not buy more GitHub Actions minutes, which is ultimately just Azure Compute. So because they have these different interests, they're able to align what they do with, with this kind of broader strategy uh, at the corporate level that most uh, even smaller for-profit companies don't have access to. Uh, a more independent funding model, and by independent I mean either a smaller software vendor or an independent group. You might look at something like hosting. It's a popular one. GitLab uses a lot of uh, uh, places will make you pay for hosting supposedly fits the open core model, or just straight up licenses where you're selling the software, not open source at all. Um, there's patronage, uh, which is a, is a model where somebody's, you know, who's more power, an entity that's more powerful and more wealthy than you says, you know, you do your thing, I like what you're doing, you have the freedom to do it, uh, I'm gonna support you and you know, let you do that thing and I'll do something my own stuff. Uh, Jenkins is kind of that model since that's that they, they adopted things, and, but then it's also open core. It's a little of a weird case, that one. Um, and then consulting is where you could build a product and say, okay, I'll provide support and services around this. Uh, GoCD was that before it, 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 you know, it went 
uh, defunct, but uh, I think famously in the Linux community, Red Hat kind of operated on this model for a long time. Uh, still does, to my knowledge. Um, the problem with some of these models, the, there's different problems with each one. They have different failure modes. Hosting and licenses, especially around open source, they give you weird incentives. It could, you're basically, if you want to do open source at all, you're driven towards open core because you're worried about competitors coming in and hosting things for you and taking away some of them, all that hard earned, you know, taking away the money you believe that you, can, you should be earning um, with, while, while putting in less investment work into the actual product to begin with. So the incentives, you tend to leave things out of the main product. You tend to, avoid, you tend to solve the problems that, you're, that you think will give you money and will drive your customer base, but not necessarily be better for the, uh, the service itself. When you're in a patronage situation, you're, you're dependent on the, the patron's interest staying in line with yours, and that's not something you can always control. It's not even something always the patron themselves can control. If you know, you're with a company and then the investors are, uh, of that company are like, well, what's going on over here? You know, they can influence those things. Uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions can happen. All kinds of stuff can affect that patron relationship that you're dependent on for your product. Uh, so it's not always the most stable thing, and you have to understand the specifics of what's going on before going into that. Uh, a consulting model uh, has, has scaling issues in that typically your, the amount of usage is going to, going to scale very closely, almost linearly, with the amount of work you have. So while you'd like to be able to spend more of your work time fix making your project better and better, you don't necessarily get to uh, because you're, uh, you're having to do more work for your clients, which is a good thing, but... You know, it, it doesn't, again, like, that's why VCs don't like consulting, because it doesn't scale. Um, and then there's the foundation models. It was not a model I fully understand. I know that there's people uh, in the, uh, you know, involved with, with some of the larger software foundations out there, like the Linux Foundation and the, uh, the Apache Software Foundation, and they have ways of doing governance and funding things that, that seem to work. Although, I will say, this is the, the, uh, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, a part of the Linux Foundation. This is their landscape model of... Uh, uh, CICD, including three projects they have, and frankly, they're all related to Kubernetes. Um, so I, I don't know, not every project I've dealt with is Kubernetes. Uh, I'm not sure how useful that is for the, uh, for the community at large. So I, it's, it's not always clear to me if the foundation makes sense in this world. But how would we compete if we wanted to have an open source project that actually functioned in this environment? We'd have to find the right incentives. Uh, I, so I think it's really clear that hosting and licensing while they can produce some really valuable stuff, GitLab is cool, like I have nothing wrong with, I have no problem with GitLab, but they're never going to, uh, like the community project is something you have to, you have to run yourself, and, and in a lot of ways, that's not going to, uh, that's still a problem in the field, especially for open source and especially for resource-starved um, businesses. So there's still problems in the field that, that we can find. Um, switching costs is still a major issue for a lot of people. We can't be looking at how we can build a new server. That's not going to fix this problem because people aren't going to run it. What do we build instead? I want to try to reframe the problem. About 40, 50 years ago, all programs were written in assembly. Like, or there, were, there were other programming languages like Fortran. And, but generally speaking, a lot of programs were written for a specific machine architecture. Um, you know, in this case, I've had the PDP-11 up there. until. Until we started having the, you know, like C, which at that time was called a high-level programming language, and his main point was to let you compile for different architectures. I see this parallels a lot in what we have for different backends for, for CI/CD, in that we have a lot of different offerings that each have their own specialties, but we have some way we would like to actually target them potentially, and this could save people a lot of work if you know if it if it solved their problem. There's also a, a time. Uh, in history when all version control systems were, uh, uh, were they were central servers. You, know, you needed to, to, to deal with it. This is a, as early as 20 years ago, um, or early, um, even later than that for, for some projects, it depends. But if you were dealing with CVS, if you're dealing with subversion, in order to check out, you need to be connected to the server at that time. Uh, you couldn't just uh, you know, clone all of it on your machine and do it, make your own branches. All those operations were server-centric. And, uh, and the Git came along and was like, well, that doesn't have to be server-centric. It's just different whole copies of the thing that talk to each other. We could do the same thing for CI/CD. There doesn't, there's no reason it has to be a server. And what would the requirements of something like that look, look like? Well, we'd want to have um, a bit of 
vendor or back in independence. We don't want to be tied to a specific operator for our system. Uh, we don't want to require people to manage deployments because that's an operational headache for, again, especially open source projects and small teams, but even larger teams that don't specialize in this kind of stuff, they can find it you know, quite cumbersome. That's why they pay people to do it. Um, we want to be neutral towards the software type. I, I don't care if you're, you're you know, a, a library you know, in whatever language or if you are a, um, a cloud-bound uh, containerized application or a mobile app or whatever. I don't, it, it, sh it shouldn't matter. That's why it, it, it confuses me how all this investment is going into the Kubernetes-only world. It seems to be that driven by cloud companies wanting you to spend more on cloud and not on solving the real problems that people have in the field. It should run anywhere, especially locally. Um, this for us at Ivan is actually one of the primary motivations of why we're getting involved in this is because we've had so many problems with developers having difficulty reproducing what actually happens in CI on their local machines. Uh, and the more, the more complex your system gets, the more, the, the more crucial this is. Uh, in fact, systems like I know Circle CI and GitLab, I believe, have have features where you can log into the, you know, you have, they have observability features where you can log into the running agent to see what's going on there because this is such a big problem. Uh, and you, if you, but ultimately you're reliant on the, the, uh, the, the system you know, that, you're, that you're working with or the, you know, the people who are operating it to allow that kind of thing to work. Um, in a lot of cases, it would just be easier if you could do it locally. We want to play nice with build tools and IDEs. There are some things in this space that uh, kind of, they, they look at this problem, they step really back from it and say, oh, I, I know how to solve it. I'll reinvent everything from scratch. Uh, and I can talk about what some, what some of those are in a bit. That's a pain for developers, because developers get used to certain tools. They get used to their IDEs working a certain way. They want to be able to see things. Um, so likewise, some. There's some tools out there that, that do similar to what I'm talking about. They turn your CI into one command, which is great, but then you can't see, you have no observability as a developer as to what's actually going on. CI, CI CD systems invest a lot of money into having user interfaces that uh, allow you to, to, to visualize what actually happens during the pipeline, and if you turn that into one command, you lose that immediately or have to reinvent it. Lastly, I think we need to provide extra value, or second to last, we need to provide extra value uh, on top of what things are already getting. I think this is one of the areas that we are generally, let CI CD systems actually lack, is they don't, they give you the toolkit to build things, but they don't tell you how to build these things. And I think that's, a, that's, that's an area that's, worth, that's definitely worth exploring is, you know, can I, can I look at projects and see what would the pipeline be for this in, 90% of the cases and help you get there. I think that, that, that that's an area where we can actually build, not just replace, but, but build on what current solutions are doing. And uh, in order for this to think to really be legitimately open source, this can't be a way to trick people into paying. Uh, I mean, you know, unless you're talking about donating to a foundation or maybe looking for services or something like that. There's some prior art in this field, and this is not a unique idea to me. Um, Make files, I, I, I've, I've actually heard this suggestion. I don't know if you, how, how, how deeply you guys are into make files, but I, I've, I've had non-ironic suggestions that we should use make files to do this. And considering that I think in the last week, I've had three different make file bugs uh, th that happen intermittently on different machines, uh, I don't think that's a scalable solution. Um, if there's some of you that are smiling and you, you've encountered these kinds of things. So it, it, it's not a mature build system. It, it, it's something that was written in the, in, the, in the 1970s to solve very specific problems and people abuse the hell out of it. Um, Dagger is a cool new solution that does most of what I was describing, except that it's, a, uh, it's, it's designed specifically to funnel you into their cloud system. And so if, you know, it, 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 the whole idea about being, developers having exactly the same uh, reproducibility locally as they do in CI, Dagger provides that. But it also jettisons all other CI CD systems. It uh, and, and doesn't let you do di distributed computing or even really remote computing without uh, using their their paid service. And on top of that, I don't think it, it engages in much in terms of intelligence about the code you're dealing with. You have to go into quite a great le uh, level of detail in order to get a meaningful build out of it. So I think there's some design uh, problems that from the start. For really simple projects, I've seen people use pre-commit successfully to solve this problem, 
or they just say, okay, my CI CD is pre-commit. The, the problem there is it's incredibly simplistic. Uh, and so unless your CI CD, it, unless your pipeline is very simple, this doesn't do you very much good. And at the far end of the spectrum from that, there's monorepo tools. And by that, I mean things like Bazel, Pants, Buck, if you've heard of these, these tools that uh, reinvent the entire build process from the ground up. Uh, they have deep, deep, deep knowledge of what exactly is going on in your code, what targets depend on one another. Uh, the, you know, they engage in, in analysis and have all kinds of plugins and things. The challenge there is that they're so into their specific way of doing things is that typical tools and often developer knowledge don't work with them directly. And that's what I mean by having to reinvent every possible wheel. Um, these are tools that were invented mostly at, uh, at the larger Silicon Valley um, companies out there, your, your Metas, your Googles, um, your Twitters, where they, they were solving problems at their scale that not everyone has, and also with access to tooling that not everyone else has. So I'm not sure. While I, you know, I, I actually work with the Pants team quite a bit, and I think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, tool and it can be useful for some projects, I'm not sure that uh, it's, it's meaningful for every project, or, and it's not a way to solve this problem in general. What I propose and what we're trying to build right now is a tool chain for this, and that's a pipeline compiler. We, we analyze what sources are in, 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 your, in your source tree, and we spit out a pipeline definition. That, that's the key idea is that we're not, we're trying to rely on, although you do have some specification in config, we're trying to rely mostly on analysis to figure and convention to figure out what actually needs to happen here. Obviously, all build systems get complicated and we need, we need good ways to, to break out of those boxes and, uh, and, and move forward. But we also compile this for multiple targets. So the idea is that the same thing happens on, uh, on you know, uh, locally as happens in GitHub Actions, as happens in Jenkins, and right now as it happens in BuildKite. Those are our, the backends we're looking at at this point. Um, there's a couple reasons for, for that. It sounds like a bit wasteful, but um, some things that I can't necessarily share about, about how we do things at Ivan. But uh, the idea there is that this would help teams that, uh, that one, need, need that local reproducibility. Uh, if you don't have any say over your CI infra, which is a case, and, and I know, I've known many teams that have had this problem, where you know, somebody, either some VP or somewhere else in the company just says, we use this, you know, get used to it, uh, and that isn't solving their problems, uh, I think we can find a way to implement the, the better solutions we found out there. Things like uh, BuildKite's dynamic pipelines are an incredible idea that aren't really available in most of their CI systems. Can we re-implement in other places? Possibly. Um, do we want to avoid lock-in? Uh, I don't know how many teams are super worried about getting locked into one CI CD system. I think if it's a concern, um, because you don't really, you don't think about it a lot, you don't, uh, I worry about it for open source too, about Microsoft essentially having kind of the keys to how, how, um, how most open source software gets delivered through GitHub Actions. I don't think they would necessarily do anything with that, I don't, I don't know, but uh, if, if that's something that worries you, then this, this could be useful. Or for teams that just care about other things. Um, you don't want to devote resources to this kind of problem. These are icky pro I love this kind of stuff. Like, I, I will sit there and deal with build systems and CI all day, and I'm weird, and I know that. Like, most developers, they, they want to ship things to customers. They don't care about this stuff. And I don't really blame them. That, that, that's probably a, m a more sane impulse. Um, but it still becomes a massive headache uh, for a lot of people. And I think that's how people end up getting drawn into it. If we could solve those problems, especially for open source developers who, who really should be, who don't have much time to begin with, that would be awesome. There's a lot of pitfalls to avoid when trying to do something like this. Uh, it's really easy to build bad abstractions that don't provide any value. Um, and that's something that we're having to work through really carefully in our design process. Um, it's also very, very easy to make bad plugin architectures. Uh, again, when you come to my talk at some point about how much I hate Jenkins, we can, we can uh, go into that uh, about messy plugin architectures. But it's something you know, that we're trying very, very difficult to avoid by approaching this carefully. Um, we're driving, we're trying to derive what we do from meaningful backends. Like, we have to look at what's actually out. We're not trying to reinvent, every, again, we don't want to reinvent every wheel that's been out there. In the previous talk they, uh, here, they were talking about standing on the shoulders of giants and choosing boring technology. We're doing that too. We, don't, we, we want to see what is actually offered by real systems and leverage that and possibly re-implement it for other systems. 
Um, we want to implement cases that we know well. Um, and we know a lot of cases because of the work we've done, but trying to overgeneralize, I've seen a lot of, the, uh, of these kinds of solutions that try to be and a one-stop shop for these things, overgeneralize too early, and that's how you end up with abstractions that don't make any sense and don't, uh, and don't really solve anyone's problem and don't have value adds. They just are another mental model you have to memorize. Uh, we're starting to look for harder open source cases out there, like where are open, it's pretty easy to go through GitHub and take a look at, you know, which .github folder is the biggest uh, of the open source projects, you can start to find some interesting cases out there and see what, what, what problems you need solving. Uh, and we expect to get a lot of things wrong on, during this process. Um, so we can't be too wed to some of our bad decisions early on. Um, and that's why this, this is going to be an incubating project for a while. But uh, we hope to you know, land something you know, within, a, you know, within a year or two uh, that can be open source and maybe have a you know, 1.0 at, at that level. As for funding, uh, you know, beyond just what, what's happening at IVE and we're building with it, uh, uh, we're using our research time. You know, we, you know, we have 20% time we get to do cool things like this, and that, that's really awesome. Um, as it grows, we have to organize. And possibly, you know, maybe eventually at some point down the road, we start offering uh, solutions and support. And to go back to our fund, the funding models I mentioned before, these are, this is just patronage. Uh, you know, foundation models, consulting. It's nothing new there. But we're trying to avoid the, those nasty incentives that, that I think drive people away from open source and towards relicensing and towards uh, uh, the, the kind of things we don't want to see. As for, um, as for who's funding me, I'll, t I'll talk briefly about Ivan. Uh, we're a, uh, well, your trusted data and AI platform. We provide a unified uh, storage, streaming, and search uh, uh, hosted and managed services of some of your favorite open source projects across multiple public clouds. Uh, if you're interested, you can check us out. Uh, and as far as me, uh, that's my contact information. I'm all about uh, software delivery, shipping better, faster. Um, not much information there yet, but you can find my contact info there and uh, follow up if you want more. Sorry. Are there any questions? Thanks, Josh. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Josh? Okay. Ha, huh. someone. Thank you for the talk. It's nice to see uh, someone talking about the elephant in the room, which is how we test the things we build, especially <laughs> as we build more and more. Uh, one thing that gives me hope for uh, open source platforms of CI is that many of the things we expect from the CI is getting commodified. Uh, linters, testing frameworks that have harmon like unified interfaces such as PyTest, many things give me hope that where you run it and maybe how you run it becomes less and less important because the thing you run can be run locally, can be shared, can be iterated on. But I probably have blind spots and you know better than me on CI. Do you see things that you believe should be standardized like the testing, like the, the linting, and that today many CI platforms do in their own way that you think actually could be a component that we could itself extract and standardize from this? Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what we're aiming at here. We think that the, there tends to be it pretty easy to standardize around certain elements there. Like you mentioned, you mentioned PyTest and like, like it, it depends on there's a lot of different like requirements. Like if you're really testing a Python project, you have I mean like linting is getting pretty standardized uh, for the most part. Then there's like the whole Astral set of tools that are coming out there too. But there's a lot about Python that is not at all standardized. Um, like how you actually get the software um, on you know into your development environment or how you actually build the packaging. That that that's extremely in flux. Um, you. Uh, how you actually run tests can vary quite a bit. PyTest doesn't scale. Um, it, you know, there's like we try to run PyTest, like one PyTest invocation for, you know, twenty thousand tests. It doesn't work. It's it, that's not how, like JUnit does. PyTest doesn't. I don't know why. Um, and so those are problems we're trying to solve for specific ecosystems. But it can be challenging to uh, uh, to do that again without really looking at the cases that people have. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Um, so I have 
I have this experience that when when some open source projects use uh, a different kind of build tool or you know quality assurance tool, then they'll take you to some other place where you have to make a profile, hand over your GitHub um, authentication, which is not necessarily a win for the whole contribution process. I would you agree that maybe the the better problem to solve here is to sort of break the GitHub monopoly and then get well, the CI/CD stuff going because it seems like this is just solving a small problem. Well, the, the idea is is the, is that if you could like uh, it might take like if you have an open source project like I work with the Pants open source project which which itself builds itself as, as or somewhat of a replacement to this but in order to run CI it has this really complicated um, pipeline generator of their own creation uh, because they need to shard it between so many different nodes or whatever. Um, and so you end up actually, you end up getting your whole release process for your software becoming extremely coupled um, uh, to GitHub Actions. And I know the person that did that in that case, um, he spent like four weeks of his own time, you know, getting that set up right. And he's no longer with the project. He doesn't have time anymore. So you have this situation where the, the, these projects can't move easily without, you know, saying somebody needs to spend a lot of their own time solving this particular problem to get that on some other platform. They're stuck on GitHub for the, for the, you know, for the time being because of those kinds of uh, things. Now, a lot of projects are really simple. And this doesn't really, we don't really care about that. Like, uh, I was looking at uh, Python request. Um, like, its CI is like, like four lines. Like, it, it's, a, it's a simple library. Like, all their work can go into the design work around the library. And they don't have to spend a lot of effort in these kinds of things. But that's not the case for every project, especially ones that compile native code or have weird exceptions or other things. A lot of stuff in the, in the whole um, data um, and AI world has to deal with this stuff, too, because there's so many native compiled complexities that end up going into the, that kind of thing. So I think those projects end up getting deeply coupled to GitHub, GitHub and so it is a part of solving that, that whole problem. And then. I guess solving that problem, you can move to GitLab or you can move to some other source forge or you know whatever else. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? All right. Um, thanks again for a wonderful presentation, Josh. Thanks for your keen attention. Mm -hmm.